Kia ora and welcome uh, uh, to this webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar is an essential guide uh, before going offshore for staff. Um, my name's Patrick McKibben. I'm the CEO of the Hutt Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I'm thrilled that you can join us today um, and thrilled that we have two really great experts uh, online with us today, uh, June Ranson and uh, Sean Redpath, uh, both from uh, Woburn International. June is the CEO of Woburn International, and Sean is um, a immigration advisor. So uh, they're going to provide you with some great information today um, and uh, help you on your journey of uh, today's New Zealand Im immigration system. Um, Woburn International is well versed in handling the challenges associated with supporting uh, both individuals and companies to establish themselves uh, in New Zealand. Uh, Woburn International were established in 1991, so have um, over 30 years of experience um, in delivering and supporting all aspects of immigration needs. Um, we will have the chance at the end, uh, after the presentation, to uh, have some questions. Um, so if you have any questions, pop them into the chat and we'll endeavour to answer them um, at the end um, or come back to you uh, after the event um, if we run out of time. So uh, really happy to have June and uh, Sean here today. And uh, June and Sean, I'm going to hand over to you and um, I'll see you in a little while. I'll be watching carefully and uh, seeing how things go. So thank you very much, June and Sean. Thank you, Patrick. Cheers, Patrick. Now, yes, this is a really controversial and hot topic to be looking at and highly political. So let's kick this off by looking at the essential guide before going offshore for staff. So why should you be looking overseas for staff? Um, New Zealanders basically don't want to take up certain types of positions. And we know that you know, you can advertise as much as you like, but you just don't get the New Zealanders coming forward. Then we've got the shortages in New Zealand in many industries, and they're making it increasingly difficult to find suitable people locally. Now, this week in the greater Wellington region, there were three and a half thousand jobs uh, listed as vacant. Um, and they, they were covering things ranging from the service industry, engineering, police, construction, etc. And I know you would be feeling this as well. Now, many New Zealanders are looking overseas, particularly Australia, and, and they're looking at the higher pay and similar roles. So we've got to do what we can to keep these people here. New Zealand has got a good reputation globally, so can attract the high standard of overseas candidates but we do have to do a little more. So since COVID, New Zealand has seen a population decrease due to the low level of migration. Now, the industries facing the biggest shortages is that immigration, they are aware of some of these shortages and have put in place a few options to assist with such positions being placed on what they known as a green list. Um, and that's, that's an easier pathway to residence. And that's what a lot of these migrants are really looking for. Um, they're wanting to know that they've got a future here. And there are also, if they're on that green list, there's an exemption um, providing, uh, there's the, the medium wage of 29.66 per hour and some lower pay positions can be filled. Now, here are the main areas Immigration New Zealand have as shortages. We've got agriculture, construction and infrastructure, engineering, health, social services, ICT, electronics, telecommunications, sciences, trades, tourism, hospitality, and the factory processing of work. Um, so as June mentioned, um, yeah, there's been a huge shortage um, of, of people um, in New Zealand since COVID, and this is due to mainly um, the, the border closure and um, 
migrants not being able to, to enter. So that's left a lot of jobs um, vacant. So just wanted to show you this graph here. Um, the key line to look at is the black line, which shows um, obviously a huge drop um, in numbers um, of, of our population. Um, and yeah, obviously since the borders are reopened, we've also um, seen a lot of people leaving. Um, so we need to replace those with, with migrant um, workers. Um, so here's, um, I'm just gonna have a quick overview of the current Im immigration process. Um, so this was introduced in July last year. So some of you might be already familiar with it, but some of you um, may not know about it at all. So it's a three-step process. Um, so the first um, thing you need to do is become accredited as an employer in New Zealand. Um, so immigration will, will check um, if you're eligible. Um, the next um, step is a job check. So this is to make sure there's no New Zealanders who would be available um, to do the role. And then um, the third step is um, once you found a migrant worker, or a worker overseas, who you think would be good to fill um, the, the, the job, then um, we can start the, the visa application or the migrant check. Um, so I'll go into each of these steps in a bit more detail. Um, so the first one is the, the employer check. Um, so as I say, this was introduced in July last year. So many of you might already be accredited, but for some of you, this might be the first time um, hearing this information. Um, but yeah, basically immigration are wanting to, to check that, you know, your business is gen genuine and it, it's operating. Um, and they're going to want to check that um, if you do bring any migrants that you'll, you'll be able to support them. Um, they'll check your history with immigration and employment and business practices. So um, if you've been compliant um, in the past, um, as an employer, you need to um, pay all the recruitment costs. You can't be passing any of these costs on to the migrants themselves. Um, once you become accredited, you'll be given 12 months to complete some online modules. Um, this is so you're up to date with the current um, regulations. Um, and yeah, these, these need to be done within 12 months of becoming accredited. And that's um, all key business people in, involved in hiring and, and HR generally need to complete these, these modules. Um, and your employers will also need to complete some modules so they know their own rights um, when they come to New Zealand. Um, so there's a few different types of um, accreditation. So if you're not looking to hire many migrants, um, there's a standard accreditation which would uh, let you employ up to five. Um, if you're looking at hiring a lot more, then um, We've got the high volume accreditation, which um, gives you the option to hire six or more. Uh, the only difference between the two really at this stage is the um, fees. So the standard is cheaper than the, the high volume. Um, the other options are for if you're a franchise. Um, so there is additional requirements. If you're a franchise, you need to provide a lot more supporting documentation. The process is a bit more um, involved. And the same if you're a controlling third party. So if you're placing migrants um, within other companies, um, yeah, the, the process is a bit more complicated and you need to get a different type of accreditation. Um, so the, for the franchise, um, this is for businesses that are purchased as part of um, a franchise. So there's lots of businesses franchised out. Um, so you'll be using one brand um, trademark. Um, you generally have a marketing person or advertising who do do everything. You'd need to follow um, certain guidelines. Um, the additional requirements, um, you need to be operating for at least 12 months as a franchise 
and 15% uh, for your workforce um, need to be New Zealand residents um, who work 30 hours a week or more. Um, and for the controlling third party, um, so this is when you're hiring out workers to um, other, other companies. So this is generally labour hire companies um, or large organisations who have um, smaller companies under them. Um, and again, you'll need to provide additional documents um, such as how, how you monitor your migrants' safety when you're not directly overseeing how they're, um, you know, being um, used so there's no exploitation um, there. Oops, sorry, I forgot to switch the slide. Um, so that's the um, accreditation side. So the next um, part is the job check. Um, so this is just to make sure there's no suitable New Zealanders or residents who um, can do the role that you're looking to fill. So immigration are, are looking for a, a New Zealander first approach. Um, so in most cases, um, you'll need to advertise the position um, for at least two weeks. Um, most websites, uh, the most common websites are Seek and Trade Me. Um, so you'll be familiar with those. Um, it's essential you get the advertising right the first time. Um, we've seen a lot of cases where an employer has gone ahead and advertised but left crucial information off the advertisement. So immigration do have um, certain requirements that need to be listed on the advertisement. And if they're not there, then the job check will be um, basically declined um, or you need to re-advertise for a further two weeks. Um, so there are a few cases where you don't need to advertise and that is those earning twice the median wage. So that is currently $55.52 per hour. Um, or if the role is on the green list, which June um, mentioned earlier. So there's um, plenty of roles on the green list. Um, so these are shortage areas. Um, so teachers and, and nurses and these sorts of things. Um, so most jobs apart from a few exemptions need to be paid at least the the, the medium wage which is 29.66 an hour um, as i say there is a few sector agreements in place um, for caregivers and um, transport sector um, who can be paid less um, but we'll go through that a bit more um, so you can advertise um, the same position in one job check. So you don't need to do, as long as the position is exactly the same, you don't need to do um, different job checks. You can do one for multiple people. Um, and yeah, the, the fees for that is $610. Um, and then we, once you've got the job check approved, we move to, you'll receive a job token, which will allow the migrant you've chosen to make a visa application. Um, so yeah, you can't officially offer the, the position until the job check's been approved. So uh, something we see often is contracts signed before the job check is done, um, which we, you can't submit um, to, to immigration because they'll think that you haven't genuinely um, looked for New Zealanders because you've had someone in mind already. Um, so yeah, you'll once the job check is approved, you'll get a job token, then you offer the position, and then um, you can go through the visa process. Um, so yeah, current processing times are about 20 working days, and the government fee for that is $750. Um, dollars. Um, so yeah, you hold your accreditation for 12 months, although it has automatically been extended for those who applied initially to 24 months. But if you're applying right now at this time, you'll only get 12 months and then you'll need to renew. Um, at the renewal stage, you'll need to show that you've complied to all the declarations you made during the accreditation application. 
So it's very, very important that um, you're compliant, you are recording um, everything, that modules have been completed, that the pays have been continuing to meet the median wage. So any breach um, could mean your accreditation is um, revoked, which means you'd no longer be able to support any migrants, um, which it yeah, could be um, for those heavily reliant on overseas workers could be a, a huge um, problem. Um, so um, the Labour Inspectorate does do spot checks. Um, so at any time someone could come and check, they could show up at your business and check your employees' visas and check pay records and all that. Um, we know that immigration doesn't have a huge um, staff, so they, they don't have a lot of people coming out, but the, the, they are definitely showing up at businesses and if there's any concerns. Um, and, yeah, if any key people are on um, any lists or have had issues in the past, then that could affect um, the accreditation. Um, and, again, um, yeah, if you're hiring new people, you need to be um, making sure they don't have any history of breaching because that could um, affect your business in the future. Um, and, yeah, obviously there's... Um, penalties um, as well if, if you're exploiting migrants or, or breaking any laws. So you, not only would you lose your accreditation, but you could be at risk of some um, fines or, or things. Right, the pitfalls of accreditation. Now, the very first application that you put in, you are in fact giving and signing declarations to immigration uh, and you're stating that you have met their requirements. And it includes looking at people who are going to be signing uh, the application, that their credentials are in order. So how they check up on you is when the renewal, which is in 12 months' time, uh, is required, the business has got to prove and provide the evidence that you've met those declarations. It also covers the policies that you've said that you have, uh, and those policies cover everything from health and safety. They cover uh, the policies relating to um, your human resources, how you are, in fact, looking at after your staff, it's, it is quite a, a lot, and those policies, of course, vary by different industry groups. So very important that you have all of those policies in place. Not providing a full list of the key people can be considered very misleading. As one of these declarations that we spoke about, um, you are saying that you've got no criminal backgrounds, you have, in fact, never been bankrupt. Um, you are, in fact, squeaky clean. And it can raise uh, issues in the future. And as Sean mentioned before, having a member of staff who's breached or under current investigation is, once again, uh, an issue that immigration would pick up on. Employers, the key people, must complete the modules in the first 12 months. These modules relate to employment law, and you must you must complete those. So, the advertising that Sean mentioned with regard to the job, if that fails to include requirements for uh, the salary range, uh, we don't say put the specific salary in because we're very much aware that employers don't want to tell their competitors exactly what they're going to offer. So you put in a range. Um, you'd put in the hours of work. And remember, uh, 30 hours is the minimum. Uh, and the required qualifications and experience that you're wanting. So their immigration do check that. They check those advertisements. Now, 
the pay, if that doesn't match the market rate, so once again, you've got to do your homework, I would be suggesting you go in and have a look at the pay rates that have been offered on the internet, uh, because that's one of the areas that immigration will look. And if you're offering uh, something much lower, they're going to be very much querying that. Um, and not listed for the two week, two whole four weeks, or using outdated adverts. Um, that's a no no. We've had people ask us, employers saying, well, what if I put it at the advert in our in industry magazines? Yes, that's great. Uh, but you also need to look at the likes of SEEK. New Zealanders have an applied and no justification why New Zealanders are not employed. Look, we say make up a spreadsheet and list down the people that have applied and then look at, well, who is the best person for that job? Now, you may already have identified who you want before you've actually advertise and you're basically going through the mechanics of it all you've still got to give justification as to why you want the person you do because new zealanders must come first you've got to make sure about the earnings of the 29 dollars 66 per hour or higher the applicant's qualification and work experience if they don't match what was actually advertised and you are putting up your candidate that you really do want, if they see that there's something wrong here, you've got to be able to justify it. It's all about telling a story. Uh, additional hours worked when on a salary. You've got to be very, very careful of that. And this is what would be included in your employment agreements, how you word those. And they're going to be looking at, okay, you've got this person working beyond 40 hours. So how is that going to affect the salary that they're actually going to be receiving if they're going below the medium wage and you're not paying overtime? And then there's undisclosed character or health concerns. Now, these uh, character and health uh, concerns you need to do your homework. Uh, I know it can be quite uh, difficult when you're dealing with a person you don't know. And that's one of the advantages if you use anybody independent because they can identify this. Because if the person's character hasn't um, been squeaky clean as such, there can be a way to go for character waivers. It very much depends on what that criminal offence was. But we undertake a lot of character waivers. And I mean, many of these are driving or uh, drunk driving, uh, but some of them can be more, uh, more serious than that. But it needs to be looked at. Now, when you don't have the luxury of meeting the people in pace before offering employment, uh, that's very hard on employers. And of course, you've got to use Zoom. Um, you shouldn't just rely on just one Zoom meeting. You should do more than that. And you should also look at meeting the family. If family are coming in as well. You want to meet them. Because in many instances, the principal applicant is the one that's really keen to come, but the family may not. And you need to get a feel for that. And meeting the partner is very good. They should be interviewed as well. So they arrive in New Zealand and they're not of a good fit for your organisation. What do you do? You've got to uh, think about how you're going to work through this. And that's very important. And that's why if you can identify up front by more than one interview, you can find out a lot of things. But if you need help, do talk to people. And we do handle a lot of these. Um, their skills are not up to standard. Yeah, that can be very um, serious. They can look very good on paper. But sometimes look beyond this because we had a case where we had an ind individual that was highly qualified. He was an engineer and he was, he was working in a company up in Auckland. And I called in to see the employer a couple of months later. 
and they informed me that the uh, the guy wasn't working out and they said they couldn't understand why and it would appear there was, there was a cultural barrier here because this guy did not like to be seen as not knowing what he was doing and he was he was working all hours to try and be able to correct this and his supervisor was trying to find out how to resolve the situation but it was a breakdown in communications and it was a cultural barrier and we were able to resolve it and it all worked out fine so these are you just got to take a step back and think what on earth's going on here good references good qualifications but yet doesn't work out you're spending a lot of time and money on the person it doesn't adjust in new zealand and you've got to think well how can i fix this and it's very important that you do get this right so some of the things that can help towards this you've got to remember look it's a very stressful time packing up your whole life and moving to another country um, and the amount of support that people get on the ground uh, is important. Look, I'm going to mention here, I mean, we've had this horrendous case that's just been in the media recently with regard to the, the folk that went to Timaru. And I believe that there was not enough assessment of the wife, nor understanding <laughs> what she was going to be confronted with. There wasn't enough assistance. And that was part and parcel. And it makes you wonder what else was, in, you know, caught up in that. But the advantages to have the migrants actually come and visit first is huge. Um, and I know I've heard employers say, well, look, I'm giving them a holiday out here. But you've done your homework first. You've spoken to them at least a couple of times by Zoom, you've met the partner. In some cases, you meet their pets. I've done that. I've met their po pets on Zoom um, because they, they can be regarded as an extra member of the family and it's important, especially if they want to bring them. So making them aware of what New Zealand is really, really like, assisting them in finding the accommodation. You see, when you've got a family coming, the partner wants to be involved as well and she has a huge he or she has a huge impact on how successful this role is going to be and of course they can feel oh this employer really does think a lot of us they're providing us with extra support to help us phone finding very important so give the person a pathway also if that's possible to obtain residence they need to be given a factual account of what is possible because they are uprooting and this is their future so how can you support the migrant workers for the best long-term outcome look prepare them for what to expect now we have a, a book that we send out to everybody it's online they go through and they can read it and it answers a lot of questions um, and I know a lot of employers, really good employers out there that really do try to help these folk. But the employee and the family are not necessarily going to reveal everything to you. They're keen to start a new life and they don't want to say anything to put a foot wrong. So if you can get independent assistance, do so. Having them collected from the airport, giving them a tour of the local area, very important. Get them introduced into networks of the people in New Zealand. Try to connect them so that they can, in fact, start to feel at home as soon as possible. So that the quicker they're able to feel comfortable, they'll be able to feel their actual potential. And I mean, when if they've got children, yes, it opens up doors because they're going into schools, etc. But you want to be involved in their lives. You want to be able to... Um, the parents do, they want to be involved in their kids' lives. So be mindful of that. It's just not just a matter of bringing the person here and think, right, they'll be right. It's not like that. They do need help. Sean? 
Um, so, yeah, as June mentioned, um, it's not just the worker coming. Um, there's um, partners, children. Um, so it's one thing that needs to be considered. So in most cases, partners are able to get a work visa. So as long as they're earning, the, the worker is earning the median wage or higher, so that's 29.66 an hour, they'll be able to get a work visa with conditions. So that means um, the partner can work for a accredited employer as well. Um, they will, um, there's certain sectors they're not allowed to work in, um, but there's a few exceptions to these conditions, and that's those who are earning twice the median wage or on the green list. So they'll get an unconditional partner visa, um, which means they can work for anyone with no conditions. There's no, they can work casually. And then there's those who can only support their partners on a visitor visa. So this is people who are earning less of the median wage in those exception roles. Um, so these are already people who are, you know, earning lower salaries and they can only bring their partners on a visitor visa, which puts a lot of strain, um, financial strain on the family, especially if they've got kids that the partner can come over, but they're not actually allowed to work. So the, those who are earning more, um, their partners get um work rights, while some of the, these positions who are earning less can only bring their partners on a, on a visitor visa. So it's something that needs to be considered because if the the worker isn't aware of what type of visa the partner's getting, it can make a, a, a huge difference to their, their decisions. Um, and then there's children. Um, so school-aged children, they can come over and study um, at primary, secondary education um, as domestic students, so they don't need to pay international fees. Um, there is an income threshold, which is um, just over 43000 for them to come as students. Um, so if you're not, the person's not earning enough, then they may not be able to bring their children, which would probably be a deciding factor in, factor if they're going to come or not. Um, there are some age restrictions. So if you're considered a dependent on a temporary visa, you need to be 19 years or under, while residence visas do have a higher age threshold. So it's 24 years or older. And then obviously the, the person can't be married themselves or have children off their own and they need to be um, financially reliant on the, the main worker. So while well, sometimes it's all right to do some part-time work, um, as long as they're still mainly reliant on the, the, the parents, then, then that's okay. Um, and yeah, we've talked a lot about the, the median wage. So this is um, reviewed every year and it's currently 29, 66. Um, it was increased um, from uh, it was 27.76, so just a, under a two dollar jump. So it, it's 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 quite a lot for some employers and for some positions. Uh, so you need to be aware that this is reviewed yearly, and it, it's historically always been increasing. So in the future, you may have to pay more for staff. Um, so it's just something you always need to be aware of. Um, that yeah, this is this is just the way things are. Um, so there is some sector agreements which we've we've talked about um, or we've mentioned them as e exemptions to the, the median wage. Um, so this this is um, those who can be paid less than that um, 29.66. Um, so there's the care workforce, so that's um, carers in aged care homes, so looking after our elderly population. So they're actually able to be paid 26.16 per hour. Um, obviously, 
um, with the, the partners of these people, then they're not able to work. Um, so this, this is what we're talking about um, in terms of the partners. Um, and then there's construction and infrastructure. There's a range of jobs um, listed on this list. Um, and yeah, it's 25 per hour or higher. Um, there's meat processing, um, there's seafood uh, processing, there's seasonal snow and adventure tourism, so that's ski guides. Um, so these are areas that we know there's shortages in and that um, yeah, are generally lower paid. So there's the exception to um, the 2966. So these industries have um, made a case to, to immigration to get these sector agreements in place so they they can fill um, these positions. Um, so uh, yeah, as June kind of touched on um, and, and how to um, keep your migrants happy and to, to um, you know give them some certainty when they come over because initially they'll usually only get a temporary visa is to have them know that they've got a pathway to residence um, in the future. Um, it, it can relieve a lot of stress if they've got a, a plan that they know in a few years they, they can apply for residence and, and then go from there to eventually one day become citizens. So there's a few pathways um, to be familiar with. So there's a straight to residence pathway, which uses the green list, which we've mentioned a few times. So um, the green list has um, a, a long list of um, roles. I've mentioned some teachers, engineers, nurses, doctors, um, people in IT. Um, so there's a big long list. Um, and if you've got an offer from an accredited employer in one of those roles, and you meet the specific requirements set out by immigration. So that could be a qualification or um, holding certain registration, then you can apply uh, for residence um, straight away. So um, you could do that at the same time as you're applying for a temporary visa, or um, you could just use that as your first option. Um, the other option is um, the work to residence pathway. So again, this is um, going off the green list. So it's separated into two tiers, the tier one roles, which are the ones I just mentioned, which can apply for straight to residence. And then there's the tier two roles, um, which can um, apply after they've worked in New Zealand earning at least the median wage for two years. So that's um, electricians, plumbers, um, those those sorts of roles. But again, it's a big long um, list. So um, if you think you might be employing someone who might fit one of those requirements, it's always worthwhile checking the green list or checking with someone um, if they'd be eligible for residence. Um, There's also a couple of those um, sector agreement roles, which also have a pathway to residence where you don't need to be earning the median wage. So again, the care workforce, so those looking after our elderly, um, if they've been working for two years in, in one of those roles and earning 28, 25, then they'll have a pathway to residence. There's also the transport sector. They have a pathway to residence, so that's um, bus drivers, truck, dri truck drivers, um, those sorts of roles after working for two years, um, then they can also apply for residence. Um, and then there's the recently updated skilled migrant category. So this is a points-based category. It's been a, around for a, quite a while, but it's just been revamped. Um, so under the old um, system, the point eligibility was 180 points, and you could claim points for 
lots and lots of different things from age to qualification to partners qualification partners work experience um so there was a lot more options for how you would claim your points but the points were a lot higher so basically it's been simplified to a six point system but um there's a lot less um things you can claim for so um you can claim for one of um these either your qualification your income or if your role requires occupational registration so you can only claim for one of those and you can gain between three to six points depending on a few factors so the level of your qualification so say a bachelor's would um, get you three points while a phd would get you six points again income um, those higher earners uh, um, favoured so if you get three times the median wage um, then you'd be eligible for six points um, sh straight away so that would be quite easy while if you're 1.5 the median wage you'd get three points and again those with occupational registration which is becoming more of a focus um, you can depending on the length of training required, you'd get a different number of points. So say a electrician compared to a, a doctor, um, a doctor would likely be able to claim a lot more points for their registration than an electrician. Um, so you can claim for one of those between three to six points. So if you're only claiming three points, then you need to gain another um three points make up the difference then the way you can do that is through your work experience in new zealand so um if you've got one year's work experience in new zealand then that's um worth one point as a, and then once you've got three years that's an additional three points so um yeah the, once you've got got your six points then you're eligible to apply for residence that way um if you meet one of the other categories that we mentioned earlier, those are definitely would be preferred. They're a bit more of a straightforward process than the um, the skilled skilled migrant, but you, you need to be aware of all your options. Um, and as I say, um, there's an increased focus on occupational registration. Um, so there's various roles where you'd be required to get um, occupational registration um, and yeah this definitely helps with residents um, in the, the long term but in the past it hasn't been so much of a focus but yeah this means things like um, carpenters then you, they now need to be a licensed building practitioner and go get a carpentry license um, um, but obviously things like doctors and nurses they've always required registration but there's some um, lower lower roles um trade type roles that um, now need to be registered with um, certain bodies to be able to um, go down the residence pathway um and yeah well what, what's happening in the the future for immigration and supporting workers um as I, I just went through, the new um, skilled migrant category has been announced. So uh, that will be in force in November. Um, there's also a recent change um, also coming in November about the length of an accredited employer work visa. So applying right now, um, you'd only be getting a three-year visa. Um, and there didn't used to be a um, restriction on how many visas you could hold. So you, once that three years was up, you could apply and get another work visa. But they're now extending um, all the visas to five years. Um, and then you're not able to apply for a new accredited employer work visa. Um, and this is to encourage people to move to residence, so to, to look at their residence options. And if they're not going to meet the residence options, then at least then they're aware that um, 
you know, they're actually going to have to leave New Zealand um, if, if they can't get their residence at the end of that visa. Well, before someone could stay on a temporary visa um, for years and years and years without ever being eligible or going to, to residence. Um, so they're really looking at encouraging people to go to residence, but it will affect um, those who might fall short. Um, um, and yeah, all um, employer accreditations were automatically extended for 12 months. Um, so if you're applying for a new one now, you will only get 12 months, but if you applied um, earlier, then that will have been extended for 12 months. So that will save you additional fees and um, needing to have everything reviewed again for another 12 months. And then, yeah, there's the median wage, which will be likely reviewed um, in the um, early 2024. Um, and then June. So the future concerns this, of course, the upcoming elections, because immigration is very political and it does put a lot of uncertainty on how the immigration policy is going to look next year. But I do know that you employers, um, you have put a lot of pressure on uh, the government. So we're anticipating that there's going to be changes. Um, and I mean, we're hearing just this week, they're undertaking a review of the accreditation system. The increasing costs on employers, look, we know that this uh, concern for those people who've got employees not on the green list being forced to up their pay rates to $29.66 an hour, it can be throwing out your relativities when it comes to your locally employed staff. Hear you loud and clear. Um, and I know um, that's echoed through in the political scene. And the yearly review of the medium wage is setting the unrealistic expectations for the employers. So look, what we've tried to do is to give you a broad coverage here of what is going on with the latest changes. They are constant. There have been more policy changes uh, over the last two years than we've had in record time on immigration. Uh, but look, we're here to answer any of your questions and just don't hesitate to come forward. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, brilliant. Um, look, that was great. Thank you very much, June and Sean. Um, look, I um, the, the information was awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, I particularly like uh, liked the advice uh, that you were giving about um, the support and the families and the um, and the information that you that employers should think about in bringing somebody to New Zealand. So that kind of care is is really vital, I think, um, in uh, in bringing uh, people to New Zealand. And once they're here, that kind of care should carry on. So I really love that. So thank you very much for that. Um, look, we have had um, a number of questions, which uh, which we'll uh, hoe into now. Um, we've got a little bit of time to do that, so let's let's uh, kick off with some of those questions. Um, uh, June, you kind of referenced the you know the future, um, but actually, in the last week, uh, we have seen in the press some some media about immigration New Zealand, um, and I guess. Um, that may worry some employers. So do, do you have any advice for employers as to how they should kind of react to the, the that media and, and some of the questions over the speed and the care in which Immigration New Zealand are taking in the process to um, uh, look at uh, applicants and applications? Well, what's actually come out in the media is no surprise whatsoever. Um, you will recall that the government had, in fact, been talking about the reset and they took uh, advantage when the regard to COVID came along. I actually was caught up in the middle of this uh, with the government. And on behalf of the industry, we had said all along that there was no way immigration were going to be able to handle the volume of accreditations that we'd be coming through because they did not have the staff to 
because they did lose a lot. And what has happened was well predicted. And the people that they had, in fact, been taken on, because when there were backlogs, they weren't getting sufficient training. So once again, many of these uh, people in there did not know how to review some of the documentation that was being provided by you employers. However, in saying all of that, you still have to get your documentation in correct. Uh, they want to make sure that you, the employer, in going for accreditation, you are able to support employing a migrant. That's what it's all about. And the thing is, they were doing their best to try to avoid this exploitation. And, of course, it backfired in many cases. And they have tried to uh, hush it up, uh, but it did come out a few weeks back. And you say, well, how do I know that? Um, I can tell you that a seminar was going to be run on it and immigration was supposed to be present to speak at it. And they decided to pull the plug and not do it. Um, it took quite a bit later for them to actually come forward. But something has now, uh, because the whistle's been blown within immigration and something is now going to be done. But what you do need to do is keep to the protocol and the rules it is now. Don't try and take shortcuts because you will be caught out. Cool. That's great advice. Um, you also talked, I think, Sean, you talked about the, um, the, the way in which immigration, uh, well, you talk about the process, uh, but you also talk about the way in which immigration may come and check on that process. Um, I was particularly interested in, you know, what, what's likely to happen? It seems like they they might be checking on the pay you're, you're giving the staff, which, you know, to make sure you're doing that, seem like they might be checking on the uh, way in which your employees are um, following the training modules. It, you know, is that, how important is all that stuff? And are they likely to, you know, how likely are they to come and um, check on you? Um, just relative uh... importance. Yeah, it, it's very important. Um, they will definitely be checking at some point. Um, you could be randomly selected or they might have concerns and they may um, come and check it at any point, um, you know, uh, next week or in a few months' time. But, yeah, that, that will be limited number of businesses who get these random checks. But when it comes to... Um, renewing that accreditation which will be um, in 12 months for some people 24 months for others then they will be checking over all these things and they'll be asking for all your pay records and um, du double checking that all your workers have completed the online modules and um, that everything and it can also affect um, the uh, the workers in the future when they apply for residence um, the, whoever's processing that residence application will be asking for the the tax records and making sure that they've been you know earning what what they've said. So it definitely will be checked at some point, um, either in a future accreditation or visa application, or as that could be a, a random in inspection um, at any point. Awesome, it's a bit, a bit like your advice before June that you should uh, follow the rules and, and take 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 up all of the opportunities to do the right thing. Um, so we also had a question around, um, I guess, the pros and cons of the different types of accreditation. Um, there was some accreditation which uh, an employer would take on themselves. And then there's also working with a controlling third party employer, a bit like a, you know, a, a job broker, I guess, at the end of the day. Well, what are the pros and cons of those two kind of options, doing it yourself versus working through somebody else? Well, look. So there's no confusion here. Um, the traditional employer accreditation is with the actual employer who would be issuing the employment agreement. Now, when it comes to the controlling third party, that's traditionally used by a number of the recruitment companies. So they become the employer of the migrant and they outsource them to employers. Now, in this happening, um, 
the advantages can be that an employer is able to check out the migrant because they're uh, seeing them in their workforce and then they make say, well, he's all right, I will employ him to be on um, our workforce. Um, the downside, well, it's going to be costing the employer more money because they're going to be paying the recruitment company the service fee because that recruitment company is going to be handling the wages, the tax records, um, but they're not necessarily going to be giving the humanitarian care, which an employer, and we're finding many employers do provide a more humanitarian uh, care basis um, for these people. So that's the downside, but it's something that uh, both services are well used, but as I said, we're finding the um, the one where they are using the controlling third party is predominantly by the recruitment companies. Okay, fantastic. Um, again, as I love the I love the idea of care for for people. That's um, yeah. it's a, it's a really important factor. Um, look, what, one final question uh, I guess was from a. Uh, an organisation who's uh, who didn't see their their job or their kind of area of expertise um, on the on the list of um, you know skilled positions. If are there those situations where where employers in particular areas uh, can't bring in migrants? What 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 advice can you uh, give those employers in those sectors um, to be able to um, navigate the way, or, or are they a bit stuck? It comes down to the rate of pay um, right. because people can, they come in as visitors and they go looking around to see what jobs are suitable, what's their qualifications, etc. And just because it's not on the green list, it's if an employer goes through the full process of having advertised the job and hasn't been able to find somebody, um, but this person who has shown up uh, does meet that requirement uh, and the providing the rate of pay is in order, they've got every chance of being able to get a work visa. So okay. you shouldn't be just put off by that. Okay. Um, I guess that's a, a, a brilliant segue into um, thank you so much, uh, June and Sean. Uh, this has been uh, enlightening. Um, I, as I say, I, I personally think the idea of um, that care and support, and uh, you know, the, your story about meeting uh, meeting the pets, um, while it seems a small thing and, and maybe a funny thing, um, you're you know you're you're bringing people to New Zealand to live and work here, and uh, making them feel comfortable and and supporting them. Because um, it is, it it sounds like a you know it's a big change for people, and it sounds like a big process for employers. Um, uh, I, you know, I think it's been really enlightening to to hear all of that. Um, so thank you. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, if anybody uh, would like to uh, contact June or Sean or any of their team, um, they can give them a call on 04 569 4861. Um, or contact them, there it is on the screen, um, or contact them at Woven International through that email address um, that's there. And I'm absolutely sure uh, they'll be there to help you and support you through uh, the process, whatever that is. So thank you um, and uh, Friday afternoon. So I wish all of our uh, watchers um, a great weekend. Um, enjoy. Thank you. Um, thanks, June and Sean. Have a great one. Okay, thanks, bye.